on this episode of Skeptico. A show about what's going on in space. Now? How big? It's what we call a global killer. Nothing would survive, not even bacteria. And a scene straight out of the movie Armageddon. Real life NASA scientists are going to ram a spacecraft into one massive asteroid. And 788,000 years ago. Again, for this very reason, that they, they, they understood this appeared to be already glass and to have come from space. So a lot of the NASA guys were arguing this had to be lunar material. That theory collapsed when we retrieved lunar materials and realized it did not mesh. But their argument was very sound. And one of the guys actually sort of said, well, look, what about if it came from interplanetary space or somewhere further out? They said, well, that's the problem. No one can take that seriously because what's the chances that it ends up in a geocentric orbit? That first clip was from the Today Show, and the second one was from today's guest, Bruce Fenton, who you've heard on this show before, and I can pretty much guarantee you, you will hear from him again. He's doing, I think, just about the most important scientific research into ET UFO, the phenomenon, if you will, than, well, really just about anyone else I can think of. And I think the reason for that comes through in this interview. Stick around. It's a good one. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. Today, we welcome back Bruce Fenton to Skeptico. Bruce is the author of several books. I pulled up one of them you can find on Amazon, Exogenesis Hybrid Humans, A Scientific History of Extraterrestrial, what's the rest of that? Genetic oh. Manipulation. Uh, there's a couple other books you're going to want to check out. I won't bother reading all of those into the show, but Into Africa, Hybrid Humans. And then Bruce and I, a couple of years ago, because I met Bruce through Skeptico, and I was so blown away at the quality and importance of this work that I took it upon myself to do a little movie we did, and here it is on Prime Video. You can watch it, 780,000 years, our alien origin story. So go check that out if you want. Bruce gets a couple little pennies if you do. But his work, I, I just have to give this little bit of introduction, Bruce. And you've been on the show a couple times. People can find you a lot of different places. But like where I want to go with this is really help people understand why I think you're one of the top UFO researchers in the world and why I think that is like makes you one of the top scientists in the world. And I think that's really hard for people to swallow. It sounds like hype. It sounds like, gosh, I've never heard of this guy or this guy's just, you know, he's so minor, you know, how can you say that? Well, let me explain my logic because I think it will play into the show in a, in a couple of important ways. So let's say you were going to take a big picture view of the UFO issue biggest possible picture you could take. You'd say, okay, do UFOs exist? Where do they come from? What do they want? Right? So these three would probably be the biggest, biggest questions you could ask. And I would suggest that unless you're willing to really take a stab at answering those questions in a scientific way, then you can't answer all the other questions that seem to dominate this discussion. Disclosure, Lou Elizondo, ATIF, abductions, good ET, bad ET, grays versus lizards, all that stuff you can't answer unless you answer those big picture questions. Now, what I'm leading up to is Bruce, more than anyone I've come in contact with, has directly tried to apply science to those big picture questions. And he does it just brilliantly in this book, but he also does it in his other presentations that he's given and in all his papers and stuff like that. So that's what makes this so important is that here's a guy who's scientifically taken a stab at research that directly gets at, even if it doesn't answer all those questions completely, it moves us towards an answer to those questions that can then let us answer 
those other questions. So what do you think of that, Bruce? I know that's kind of hard to ask you to comment on that, but I think that is in your core when I hear you talk is that you really are searching for scientific evidence that drills into these big picture questions that we so often just gloss over and assume that they're that, that, that we either know them or they're impossible to answer or any of the rest of that. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, you know, some quite accolades if you've thrown there. So, I mean, um, gives, gives me some pause to thought to, to how I would look at that. I see myself certainly as trying to apply the scientific method to extraordinary and anomalous areas of thought, you know, and those those little mysteries on the edges of, you know, a consensus uh, understanding of science and consensus culture, if you like, um, the anomalies, you know, what appealed to me, you know, those scientific anomalies. So I would say I've been on a journey from probably being quite credulous, like, you know, a lot of people go into those kind of areas, you know, accepting a lot of, um, of conjecture, and a lot of strange hypotheses that didn't have much substance to a point where I've realized that to really make an impact, you, you have to be able to explain all of the evidence, you know, all of the different constituent parts of a topic. You have to be able to understand them in a framework broader into where topics link with each other. You have to understand this vast web behind something like say human origins or uh lost parts of history that you can't just say look at the pyramid on its own and say you know wow look at that mystery you have to understand say prehistoric cultures the rise of culture rise of civilizations uh, how people could have flowed out of the you know original areas where modern humans arose you know you start realizing there's this vast uh, matrix a context for all of these kind of mysteries and that's where i've been taking to is is understanding all of these data points and bring them together. And of course, that really is part of the scientific process is to take all of the evidence and find the hypothesis that fits with all of it and explains the outstanding anomalies, right? And that, that's where I'm at. So I would say, yes, I'm applying science, although I'm not an, a credentialed scientist. You know, I have an IT diploma. I don't have uh, a, you know, a PhD in any of the hard sciences. I'm applying that scientific method now to areas that traditionally have been left as uh, areas of pure speculation mostly or have been the focus of what i'd say is fairly lackluster debunking by scientists who haven't taken the time to really explore all of the evidence but focus more on the problematic um speculative theories that are on offer which are often are quite easily dismissed quite honestly um, so I, I think I have stepped into a kind of a, a strange niche there where there's very few people that are actually applying the scientific method to seeing whether the strange hypotheses on offer actually make sense rather than just dismissing them or ignoring these topics in, in entirety. So in the field of anomalous science, yes, I probably am one of the 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 main or top people in that. Because to be fair, there's not many of us. <laughs> Bruce, let me interject because here's what I see on your path that I find interesting. And I think anyone who appreciates the application of the scientific method by people like yourself is that I see you looking at all these anomalies like you're talking about with these previous books and in your journey with your wife, Danny, who is co-author of these books and is brilliant in her own right. And we spoke to Danny when we did the film. But here's what I really like, I get excited about. In this book, Exogenesis Hybrid Humans, you found a case and then mm -hmm. you sunk your teeth into it because you found it as a vehicle for tying all these things together. So mm -hmm. it's not like you went looking, but I think so few people understand this. I was just listening to an interview you gave and the guy who is this pretty prominent in the UFO community. He just couldn't wrap his head around it because he was so skeptical, not skeptical, but just like, no, you know, that doesn't add up. That doesn't prove it this way. And instead, what I saw is like, no, what Bruce has done is exactly what somebody needs to do. Kind of go through all these little pieces on the ground until you find one piece that really unlocks it and then dig into that piece and keep digging into it and then look at the tectites and look at the flow and look at the silicon and look at how they yeah. fall and then trash that trace that back to the time period so 
-hmm. Let me see if, if that resonates with you in terms of this case that really becomes the focus of so much of your work and how important do you think that case is? How different is it? And then of course we have to give people a thumbnail sketch and go back and tell them what that, what that case is and how you went about proving it in a scientific way. And I know that's a four hour thing, but we'll just try and we'll try and shut, close it down as quick as you can. So we can then talk about the new developments that you're bringing us just lately. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's um, for me, there is no doubt that the, 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 case dealt with in exogenesis hybrid humans, you know, this uh, events of 788,000 years ago, approximately, that these events are, uh, without parallel, the most important um, sets of events that I've personally looked into, you know, <laughs> so we had Gebekli Tepe and pyramids and, you know, the movements of early humans that I dealt with in my, in my obviously previous book, which I think, you know, is really important, rewriting uh, reached out of Africa. And people would say, well, that's massive. You know, if you've really done that, that's huge. And I'd say, well, yeah, that's quite important, but it's nothing on this. So that gives perhaps some kind of scale as to how big I think it is. So I think most people in turning the sciences would say, well, rewriting recent out of Africa, you know, that's paradigm changing. That's massive. I now realize that compared to what I'm doing at the moment, that's inconsequential. You know, it's, yes, it's interesting, uh, but it doesn't really change uh, who we are as a species or really where we've come from, you know, it's a, it's an interesting change to the story, but I, I think what I'm dealing with now is something that, you know, it really would change the way we view ourselves and view change the way we view the entire arc of human history from the very beginning of, you know, the, the, the species that gave rise to Homo sapiens onwards. Um, and it's, I can't really think of, a human centric story that would be bigger than that. You know, you can have a cosmic story that's bigger, you know, maybe the rise of the universe or is, is there God? And, you know, there's the massive cosmic questions, right? But if we're talking about human beings, then this story for me is the biggest one imaginable. It's the, it's the entire arc of what made us us. Uh, what was, what was the environment like for us? What was happening at the beginning of our story that makes uh, all of this begin you know and of course that has ripple effects all the way down to now especially related to a lot of the extraordinary phenomena other topics ufos aliens experiences people are claiming they're having with alien type intelligence all of that stuff links back into this story the other thing i would interject because it even goes further than that if we could even say that and that doesn't sound mm -hmm. But it also kind of sets the clock a little bit, both in terms of, which is super important to say, okay, now the scale, we have to start looking at things 788,000 years ago. Boom. That instantly puts a different perspective on, you know, what we're worried about today and disclosure and this. And you're like, wait a minute, we have to look at it on a completely different time scale. But the other thing that resetting the clock does in a very kind of uh, amazing way, but also kind of a scary way is it resets where we are in that timeline. Mm -hmm. So we are at the verge of really using silicone to develop not only computers, but maybe a craft, you know, we're on the edge of that. We're on the edge of genetic transhumanism, you know, this and that. So even if we look at our history that we've recorded, you know, 1000 years, 2000 years, 5000 years, whatever you think we have recorded in history. Now, your work puts that into a frame of reference that is exciting and also uncomfortable because it says you are at the cusp of something that do, do you get what I'm saying? What do you think about yeah. that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the, the phrase that comes to mind is, you know, history never repeats, but it certainly rhymes because I, I think that we are in a kind of a cyclical um, temporal flow, but maybe not quite a circle, but a kind of a spiral. So that we are seeing, a repeating flavor of events. So we're not necessarily going right back to the beginning of the human story, but we're seeing things that were recurring at the beginning of the story occurring now as we reach a kind of a transition point for humans again. You know, so we're dealing with a, a very ancient human transition point, and now we can see elements of it are mirrored today as we enter another kind of transition point for human beings. And, you know, as you say, what some of these the indications of the same kind of technologies that I'm looking at in my work, we're seeing now coming into view again um, from human hands, you know, and again, because obviously I deal with 
you know, silica-based technologies, you know, AI, um, you know, modifying beings using technologies, uh, all of these things that, you know, I, I tackle there, we can see these are becoming really poignant central issues today. You know, of course, we've got warnings that AI probably represents the biggest existential threat to humans for a start, which, you know, can be like Elon Musk, who are, you know, obviously involved in that, saying, you know, that, you know, we've almost missed the boat on trying to deal with that because it's got to a point where the, you know, the Pandora's box is open. Um, nearly all of the greatest minds that are coming out of university today are going into these fields, into AI and into the technology fields, right? So there's an exponential increase in how fast that topic is going to, you know, move forward now because it's no longer a case of it's something people saw as a background uh, field. Now it's a, 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 a really a, the front of technology and a front of idea is this idea of you know AI doing everything right. The exact same thing is true when you get into genetics, and mm. even when you, particularly when you look at, hey, take genetics, take mm. globalism, one world government. Really? So on a political level, you know, if you start thinking along the thinking that exogenesis brings us, then you start asking questions like, well, how much sense does it make to have 146 governments on a planet versus yeah. one government? So that's it. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you look at the bioweapon gene therapy thing and you go, whoa, you know, mm -hmm. now different ways to affect DNA, you know? So we take, like, it's not just about you know, the genetic modification and cloning and stuff like that. It's about this whole burst of technological innovation surrounding mm -hmm. genetics. And, and again, I'm not putting any value judgment on that for purposes of this conversation. What I'm doing is really taking your work and saying, how does your work give us a different perspective? Demand. How does it demand that we take a different perspective on all of that? Well, there's a couple of ways, but one, one thing I'd highlight there is, you know, if we look at the way that technologies are sort of mixing with each other, flow into each other and depend on each other. I mean, we can see now that the military machine, you know, is very caught up with the AI developments as well. There's always been talk for years now of AI generals. I mean, and people may not understand what's happening here, but we're we're moving towards AI that will be in control of drone weapons, hypersonic crafts, and at the same time, who do people think the, is going to be running the genetic engineering? Do they really think that's humans? No. So we're going to have AI doctors, AI scientists, AI genetic engineering, right? So AI that's in charge of re-engineering humans, controlling our warfare, right? And essentially running all of our resources under this one world government. So you're, you're almost kind of engineering this godlike AI, right? So there's this spiritual dimension to it that it's, you know, we are the juice S machine idea, you know, that, that it's God from the machine, right? And it's going to be doing all of this stuff. And if you, you arc back to 788,000 years ago, and obviously the, the work I've been doing, we have this kind of story of what seems to be, you know, an AI that is connected to the beginnings of humans, the engineering, genetic engineering of humans is linked into a story of that and warfare. Um, you know, so we, we have that kind of repeating theme. So though it's not saying it's exactly the same thing happening because we're dealing with what seems to be an external AI rather than a, a human engineered AI. But again, it's this there's a resonance here, this idea of, of uh, super intelligences that are able to come in and you know calculate what they think is best for humans, modify us, change the planet, uh, control resources here and, you know, conduct warfare potentially and so I, I think we are seeing an inter, you know an interlinking between the beginning and what could be the end at least an end of this chapter of humanity involving these super intelligences and the inter interlinking between technologies between these ais genetic engineering planetary control warfare so that, that's where i see it being very important so if we get this warning from the past and an understanding that just the direction that this is going in i think it can make us maybe, maybe rethink and take a moment of pause before we, you know, steam ahead. Well, we'll, we'll see about that because there's a couple of different ways to interpret the story, but I guess in typical mm. skeptical fashion, we've jumped right to the inside baseball stuff, which is great. Love it. Wouldn't do it any other way, but maybe you better pull back and give people the five minute thumbnail sketch of what happened, uh, how this, how this research came to be. Yeah. I mean, it's quite, you know, it's, 
an extraordinary story. So the first part of this is, you know, I stumbled on a set of claims. So for people that aren't familiar with this, you know, there was um, a set of claims made back in the uh, early 1990s of an interaction between uh, an Aboriginal elder with Jerry Bostock and a well English origin uh, lady in Australia called Valerie Barrow, who had uh, an interaction with what's considered to be a sacred Aboriginal artifact called a Chiringa. Now, this is you know extraordinary you know, mind-bending story for most people would discount immediately, so which I'll understand, but we'll come to why they shouldn't. Uh, and this artifact seemingly was able to transfer information, a kind of a history of humanity. And these would be traditionally, these are an artifact they're kept as a holy of holies, a sacred of sacred, you know, away from the regular people in the indigenous um, tribes that have law around Chiringas, and there's a few dotted around uh, Uluru area. Um, there's several different you know, nations that have a history relating to these things. And they say that they were left here in the, the beginning time, in what we'd think of as the dream time, or they call it the Chiringa time, or the Al Chiringa time, sorry. And so these Chiringas linked to this Al Chiringa time and Al Chiringa beings who were involved in the creation of animals, humans, parts of the landscape, so a kind of, you know, terraformers, genetic engineers that are non-human intelligence that are, were here long ago and left these artifacts. Now, they say that these artifacts are in some way alive, that they are actually these Alturinga beings transformed into these permanent bodies. So small, portable kind of silica artifacts. Before you go there, because it's, it's great, mm -hmm. but uh, to just kind of set this up, because you said this before, but the story is so dense and so important. You were predisposed to become super interested in this and then predisposed to unpeel the onion in the layers that you did because you had this incredible background where you had been exploring these anomalies all over the world and you had other kind of non-ordinary experiences that kind of pushed you along that. And we don't have time to go into all those, but just briefly you know you are predisposed to when yeah. you hear this and this is also published in a book later on to pursue mm -hmm. it so just cover that real briefly because it's important right? yeah yeah no that's right because i mean a lot of people would simply disregard that immediately right um so unless you have some reason to think that such a series of events could be possible you probably would go no further than that, right? It'd just be this strange story that you heard and maybe poo-poo it. But because I've had, yeah, years and years of, uh, first of all, an interest in ancient mysteries, the anomalies of science, so supernormal experiences, uh, you know, the, the whole gamut of strange phenomena. You know, first of all, I'm very interested in any account that has elements like that. But secondly, I've had a lot of my own very strange experiences, including, you know, psychic phenomena, um, you know, and, and anomalous kinds of events that makes me predisposed to listen to people. Now, I don't necessarily believe word for word everything someone tells me, you know, if they tell me a strange experience. But I, I look at it as I'm, I believe that they believe something extraordinary has happened to them. You know, if they have a compelling way of delivering it, you know, and the story sounds like it could be real, I, I give people the benefit of the doubt. But of course, to actually take it on very seriously, I want some evidence, right? So, you know, then to move from, I believe you believe, and that's your interpretation of the event, to actually, I think this is quite accurate. You know, there's another transition that has to occur. But certainly, for me to even take it seriously, you know, I think it's been important to have gone through that journey. You know, when my partner, obviously, she's a shamanic healer, you know, I know she's had all kinds of extraordinary events, you know, because, you know, I live with her, <laughs> making up stories thinking about her experiences she has you know altered estates or astral experiences um she works as a professional psychic you know on the phone so, so people say you know cold reading you can't cold read people on phones and you know through emails and stuff with accurate you know information um and also she's done that for me so and i have my own experiences with um, mediumship i trained for a short period as a spiritual medium uh, and i've had all sorts of psychical experiences so what sounds like a kind of telepathic type experience in this you know a transfer of information from some kind of intelligence to the mind of this individual for me is believable because I've had experiences where there's been a transfer of information to my mind from either other people or from other intelligences. So I can understand these things happen, you know, no matter how strange they sound. 
Awesome. So now I want to pick back up on the story because again, Bruce, this is an awesome conversation. I love these kind of conversations. I don't know if people can follow it. I just have to do it the way that seems to organically spring to mind. There's such an interesting crossover point here because you're talking about, uh, one, you're talking about shamanic experiences that the Aboriginal native people in Australia are having. And then, but you're also then, and you're talking about your own experiences of communication in this extended consciousness realm that doesn't involve technology. But then what you're introducing us to as well is the possibility that in this case, this communication, this non-ordinary communication, we have to be open to the possibility that it is technology driven. Mm -hmm. So there's a real interesting crossover point, but jump over to that other side and tell us why you are willing to speculate that this particular Chiringa communication had a technology basis to it. Sure. You know, the, the thing that really stood out to me is that there is, a, you know, in, in the field of sort of space sciences, you know, there's been a lot of um, speculative thinking on what, what would we look for? From an alien intelligence you know what might they be doing you know that we could um kind of find some compelling evidence of them and one of them one of the suggestions is that you know out there intelligences may be exploring the cosmos using their technologies you know in the same way that we are just beginning to you know we want to send out solar sails and we're sending out micro probes the size of mobile phones is a new plan to explore planets and oceans right so we can imagine that there's probably civilizations out there that have done similar things and, and if they've had enough time that they could send quite advanced robots and AI probes and all the rest out into space, running their own kind of search for extraterrestrial intelligence, utilizing these autonomous robots, you know, autonomous AI. Now, this is, of course, speculative, but it makes a lot of sense. So we have a class of objects they call sort of Bracewell probes for the scientists. Bracewell, I think it's Ronald Bracewell. Uh, there's also the uh, von Neumann probes, which we make familiar von Neumann. A lot of people say von Neumann was linked into the UFO program and into very deep black projects as well, connected to the idea of there being some kind of intelligence interacting with us, which is quite compelling, interesting in itself. But these two guys both theorized that there may be these kind of autonomous AI probes that could go out, explore the universe, would be essentially immortal, maybe even have this, what we call them, self-repair, that's uh, von Neumann self-repair, so they can fix themselves if they're damaged. Uh, mine planet services, build more copies of themselves, all sorts of ideas around this kind of um, bracewell probe idea. Now, there's also a particular class of bracewell probe that is called a sentinel probe. And so these would be sent out to sit either you know, on a surface of a planet or perhaps in orbit and could record any information, you know, record anything that's happening in the biosphere. So if they detect an interesting planet with a biosphere, say, let's say, for example, like Earth, Earth has had a visible, detectable oxygen signature for 2 billion years. So if anyone's out there is looking for biospheres, that oxygen signature would be really interesting. So we can imagine many civilizations sending probes towards Earth over 2 billion years. That's plenty of time. So for any of the skeptics say, oh, it's a long way. Well, 2 billion years is a long time, right? So there's been plenty of time for these probes to arrive here. A bracewell sentinel probe then could just sit and wait and if a you know a civilization if you know if life evolves and a civilization forms that these could be in theory you know instructed to eventually make contact with a civilization and act as the intermissary of the original alien civilization that sounds kind of sci-fi but it's also a lot you know logic to and a lot of sense and we can kind of see ourselves humans heading in the direction of doing these kinds of projects ourselves right when we're not far off doing this so when you then hear about an artifact, sort of silica, small artifact that's apparently been, is linked to the idea at the beginnings of time, it's very ancient, is sitting there, you know, somewhere in Australia, and it activates and makes contact with people and starts telling them, in fact, actually, one of the theories is that these things might have a whole history of humanity, and that when they make contact, share this with us. And so it, when you hear a story where that's exactly what happens, that's kind of like the alarm bells should start ringing. Also, let me go back and make sure we re and mm -hmm. we add to the fact of the mythology mm -hmm. air quotes on that one surrounded with this object. Yep. It is sacred of sacred. Uh, the other thing you said, super interesting that I think 
relates to this story, maybe in a way that we'll get to, is that don't tell everybody about this because they won't get it. Does that, again, when you said rhyme, you know, does that rhyme with our current age when mm -hmm. we have people who think the world is flat? You know, we have people that drive around in their car by themselves with a mask on. There's mm -hmm. people, there's a gulf that's getting wider and wider between people who are able to kind of process this kind of advanced knowledge and sort it out and those who just, who just can't. And so I wonder from one, from a, mm -hmm. you could kind of take the whole thing as mythology, but also from a practical standpoint, wouldn't that be the way that you would handle advanced information? You'd say, look, you know, just kind of be careful who you share this with kind of thing. And that's the story that comes along mm -hmm. with this object. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and we live in a time where, you know, Carl Sagan kind of warned of that, you know, with a, a population that has been essentially dumbed down and is no longer, not everyone, but the, the direction of travel is the dumbing down of the population. And so they have scientific illiteracy and so that they no longer stand the technologies that are being brought out and that that suits the political elite, you know, that suits the governing elite that, because is that allows for anyone who does understand these things to come along and take control and to manipulate and take advantage. So we're in a situation where a very small number of people would really understand uh, what the capabilities of our technologies are and this direction of travel and that, you know, how this sort of scenario would make sense. So a lot of people just sound like, oh, you know, absolutely bonkers, but there would be people sitting in, you know, black projects and in top universities who absolutely are looking for these things, you know, thinking that's what we should be seeing. Let me just interject one more point, because I think this is also where this important research that you're do doing takes us, because if we are going to use this as a way to step back and re-examine everything, I think mm -hmm. I immediately go to the evil black budget government kind of thing. And I say, okay, but really, isn't that a natural consequence of what you would have to do, right? You, you have this gulf, like, the, the, like you're saying, the dumbing down. Forget about dumbing down. I don't know that there really is that, that evidence that we've been significantly dumbed down, particularly if you look at a longer lens of history. You know, we're certainly much more advanced than people 100 years ago, 200 years ago. So maybe this is again the timeline thing maybe this is the natural progression and maybe the natural progression is that gap just gets loud uh, larger and larger and in order to effectively protect civilization you naturally go to black budget secret projects and uh hidden democ you know forget democracy just kind of rule by the elites kind of thing. I'm not saying I want that. I'm not saying I vote in favor of that. I'm saying, doesn't this research cause us to maybe say, wow, how would, how did they do it? How would we do it differently kind of thing? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's an issue. The, the angler, how could we have a bad model? And, you know, is, is that the best model for humanity? Because, you know, I do recognize, and again, from researching widely, you know, in a multidisciplinary kind of fashion, that not all human brains are the same. Now, I'm not going to sort, there's no, you can't say there's any racial group or something like this, but we know now that across the board, you have neurodiversity, right? You know, I'm a person with dyslexia and Asperger traits, so I'm not the same as someone who doesn't have dyslexia. That there are differences, you know, intellectual different, you know, differences because of structures in the brain. There are people who are more capable of big picture thinking and of understanding the interlinking of subject. Now, if some of those people decided that perhaps they felt they knew best, and maybe in some ways they did know better than a lot of people, you could imagine how they might work together to try and run the world in a certain way where they genuinely feel that they were uniquely qualified and capable to do it because they can see there are people who are incapable of that level of big picture thinking. Now, it doesn't mean they've got it right, but the underlying idea is actually kind of logical and makes sense. I can definitely see how it happens. I can understand how networks of people form, you know, and we have these kind of secret societies where they carry information that they feel 
most people won't make use of and won't even understand, but that at some point will be invaluable to their networks. And so it's transitioned through to now. And as things change in our society, they can refer to that and say, well, that that's useful now. We have the technology to make use of that. And that could help form the world in a certain way that we think is for the best for the species, right? Now, the best for the species doesn't mean very nice things for all the individuals. And that that's the problem. You end up in a situation where, you know, it's a bit like the Spock when he's saying, you know, for the greater good, you know, that sometimes was it the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, right? And that's really problematic. Morally, that's really problematic because what about the few? Aren't they equally important as the many? And so, you know, you, you end up with this thing of, the, is it ever okay to sort of say, well, you know, some people are going to have to be thrown to the fire to make this perfect world. And I think that's the situation we're in. It is complex. I know people don't like to think about that, that these people may genuinely think they're doing the best and because they feel they're uniquely qualified. I just, uh, and that that's also true from a scientific perspective. And a lot of people I think who are uber logical, rational, and super smart can get to the same place. Just interviewed Dr. Dean Radin, love Dr. Dean Radin, so respect his work. He's been on this show for 15 years and he comes on and he gives the transhumanism speech. He's the guy who more than anyone else has kind of exposed the consciousness as an illusion, uh, conspiracy, materialist science. You know, it, it, he his experiments, Six Sigma results replicated around the world, completely dispel that. But where does he come to at the end? He goes, hey, uh, I, I, you know, genetic, genetic modification in order to get us towards a hive mind like bees, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And I played that and I was like, Dean, Dean, what are you saying? How, you know, but so the point is whether you agree with Dean or whether you don't agree with Dean, and I don't agree with Dean for a lot of other reasons that uh, what, what we're to make of this from a spiritual level, I think has to come into play. But the point is super smart guy, super mm -hmm. plugged in guy. He's gotten millions and probably hundreds of millions of dollars behind him for this latest startup that he's doing that will actually operationalize genetic engineering through the jab, through a different jab, but a jab that will make you more psychic, that will give you a hive mind. This is not, this is not sci-fi folks. Go listen to the interview and go look at the fact that the guy is at Boy, and move from Northern California to Boise, to Boise, Idaho, to join forces with another guy who's been doing this research, and they have a, a biogenetic startup. I mean, this is what we're talking about here, Bruce, how this mm -hmm. stuff intersects. So with that, yeah. let's leap back into the story. Hopefully people have a context of you hear now that you're hearing this, you're hearing the Tringa, you're hearing, uh, you know, so how do you go about here's the here's the cool thing about your story how do you go about switching hats putting on your science hat and say wait a minute here's something i can sink my teeth into as a scientist mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i mean it was um quite a transition really because you know you go from having some level of information that suggests something may really have happened now that's personally compelling but if, if you're going to go out and then say to people this extraordinary thing really happened i mean that takes a, a whole different level of supporting evidence and knowledge of a topic area because of course you're going to at some point have to stand and defend your claims against someone who is an expert in some of the topics that you're dealing with you know in a level where you know they've maybe spent 20 years looking at say whether it's genetics whether it's tech type somebody who spent their career on that now at some point they're going to say hang on a minute what's the what on earth is he saying so unless you have a very very deep knowledge you realize that you're only going to kind of bring on board the most open-minded people who really already kind of thought the same thing as you right they they were already convinced like yeah but we totally agree i always knew it was that well have you really convinced someone then if they always knew it was that or they just think he's all you know he's come on board with me now so so I really had to realize that, that that's not good enough to have those people come on board because they, you know, they don't need any evidence from you really. So to get to those other people who would benefit from that understanding and who, who you feel it would be important to have them look at it. 
you, you need to be able to drill down and find, okay, so where is the most solid evidence that supports my convictions or my, you know, my direction of thinking? Uh, and that that took really a deep dive going into dozens and dozens of, of you know scientific studies on these topics ranging from the particularly on the tech type topic but yes in genetic engineering you know genetic engineering the genetics of human beings um, you know paleogenomics uh, then of course into you know look reading papers on ai you know the theories of these graceful probes and I keep pulling you in these other directions and don't don't give you a chance to kind of give this thumbnail sketch that i know people hey if, if you're not familiar with this work sorry you gotta go read the book which you got to do. And then you got to go watch the video that we did. And then this is like the next level kind of stuff. Yeah. And I'm not going to apologize for that. But thumbnail sketch remind people the three, the three things you decided to focus yeah. on that because again, as a scientist, mm -hmm. even knowing what questions to ask is is so important, so difficult to do. So you mm -hmm. said, Okay, here are three things that I might should be able to find if they're real, if I'm going to test my own theory in a way that you just said I, I could really convince people. What are the three? Give us at the highlight before we go into them, dive into them. Sure, absolutely. So amongst the claims from this account were this idea that there, first of all, there'd been an, an enormous craft, a silica AI craft, a conscious craft like that had arrived here you know hundreds of thousands of years ago and that had been destroyed in orbit showering down molten silica material across the planet so that stood out I was like, well, that's big that's a big event you know there could be some traces of that so that was like number one the the second one was there was an, a, an account of there being a engineered multi-directional asteroid bombardment so kind of a, almost like a a, a planetary um, uh, re-engineering the surface of the planet or something, you know, on that scale, you know, it's multiple objects hitting the planet's surface. But while that surely also, you know, is going to leave some traces that we can find in geological records. And lastly, this idea that, you know, human beings had an ancestor that had been genetically re-engineered, you know, again, in the same period. So all of these things also happening tightly in time, not just in space on this planet important point to interject here mm -hmm. these three points and a bunch of other stuff is time stamped mm -hmm. from the chiringa into a book that is published mm -hmm. that people can go back and look at the original publication date i think it's 2003 explain explain mm -hmm. that because i kind of skipped you pulled you off that story but we have a timestamp of saying okay this is the information that came through from the bracewell probe through the head of Valerie Burrow, right? 2003, right? And it yeah. lays it all out. Yeah, exactly. So people can go in, they can read it. You know, Al Turinga, when the first ancestors were created, and say, yes, it's been out there since 2003. So it's not just, you know, uh, something that's been verbally shared and that, you know, it'd be hard to confirm that this was actually said long ago. You know, so it's out there. And that's important too, because of course, people can, although can say, well, you know, could be just fitting this story to recent discoveries, right? And that somebody just, oh, come on, I can make a sort of story about that and do some conferences or so, you know, which absolutely I, I would understand those kind of accusations. But because we have it already out there, you know, published, we're able to say, well, this account is describing things that a person, well, if they're real, the person couldn't know by conventional means. Uh, I say that because, for example, this multi directional asteroid bombardment, yes, they're, they're is an event like that, but it wasn't known until 2016. So that straight away is problematic for people that say, you know, oh, they're just basing a story around known events. Well, that wasn't a known event. Um, we also have, well, one of the interesting things is that in the book, there's no mention of, you know, Australite tectites that I focus on. So again, it's not fitting to somebody's narrative. There's a description of a craft, this material. And what I found, which isn't mentioned there, you know, is that, yes, there is this debris that fits the description. So again, it's not someone else has made a story saying these tectites were from across. You know, I found that they mesh with the description and the timing. And then, of course, this genetic engineering part, which in some ways is the most difficult to confirm because, you know, we are at a point where genetics and evolution are not fully understood. So someone could say, well, Maybe there's just some process we don't understand, okay, which I accept. But there are anomalies 
which are indicative of engineering in the past at around that same time, because that's when the ancestors of Neanderthals, Denisovans, and us have significant changes going on in the genome that change the brain, massively change our brain structure, right? So that's happening at the same time. So we have these three things all happening at the same time that are indicated in this account. Okay. And here's where it gets even more super interesting because there's some new science. So you are truly a scientist. You're constantly reading papers. You're constantly taking in new information. You're testing it, testing it against the theory. And one of the things you alerted me to is that, hey, Alex, I have looked into the tech type thing and boom, there's some new information that I want to share and it's yep. more up to date. Similarly, yes. we're going to talk in a minute about the uh, human acceleration regions and the genetics associated with that. Again, new information has come forward that has changed that timeline in the way that we understand it. It happens to totally fit in your theory. So we're going to talk about both of those, the, the basics of it, and then the new science of it. Let's start with the tectites. Yeah, absolutely. So we have been working on a paper about the tech sites for quite a while now. Um, what I realized is that to make an argument that you know something really extraordinary has happened, first of all, you have to, you know, what is the strongest area of evidence that we have out of these, these different topic areas? And my realization was it was in this tech type material. And for people that aren't familiar with tech types, tech types are a kind of melt glass. Now, they, uh, there's, there's a few kinds of milk glass. You have, of course, you have impact glasses, which you find around, you know, asteroid craters, right, which are, most people maybe are familiar with. We have, of course, volcanic glasses, and then you have, you know, human-made glasses. I mean, there's a couple of other kinds, of like lightning glasses, like fulgurites, but they're quite different. Um, tectites are a particularly strange type of glass because although they are they are generally held to be a type of asteroid impact glass, they are far more alike to volcanic glasses and artificial glasses. And there's a number of reasons. I'll give a, a very quick overview of why. And this is why this tech type topic remains a mystery and controversial and with ongoing discussion around how tech types formed. And that's for 200 years this has been going on. Just to be clear, 200 years the tech type subject has been uh, debated with different points of view on the, the story of how they form and how they are distributed. Now, the distribution is interesting because they are found in strewn fields, enormous um, dis uh, enormous fields of debris stretching for you know hundreds or thousands of kilometers. In the case of the Australasian strewn field, we are talking about a debris field that is around 12,000 kilometers long, going from China to Antarctica, and out of the edges to kind of Madagascar and out into the ocean beyond Papua, right? It's about another 10,000 kilometers across or something. So it's about 20% of the Earth's surface is covered in these Australasian tectites. So that's an, first of all, it's enormous. So we're talking about an event that is just you know, massive in scale. And these, these tectites have um, two re really important considerations. First thing is that they are very homogenous. And that is the, the chemicals in them are very well mixed throughout the entire body of the material across all of that distance. The second is they're very well fined. And people that are familiar with glass making understand that fining process of glass is so removing the bubbles and to remove, you know, removing the chemicals you don't want in there. So you heat it to a, a certain temperature over a certain period of time with certain chemicals. So you mix it, you allow the bubbling, and you end up with, you know, this high quality glasses, right? A similar process happens with volcanic glass because it's heated in a caldera over a period of time. So again, homogenous. Uh, you know, material. How does that differ from what we'd find from an asteroid? Sure. Asteroid glasses are typically very foamy. So in other words, they are full of bubbles. And the reason why is because when an asteroid impacts, and this is, you'll find the same at nuclear blast sites. If anyone's familiar with nuclear blast glasses, they're very similar to asteroid impact glasses. For the same reason, very quick events, you know, high energy, high pressure events, but short lived. So you get a lot of material melted, but around the edges, first of all, you get a lot of bubbles in it because it heats very quick, then it cools very fast. So the bubbles are trapped, right? And so you, you, anyone wants to look up images, they'll find images, they'll find it, they're very bubbly. The other thing is they contain part melt. So pieces of partially melted stone, right? 
Makes sense. At the edge of the blast zone, you get part melt. You get inclusions of unmelted stone or sand. You also get inclusions of organic material, i.e. soils, right? So that's a kind of a typical glass. Also, the glass is almost identical chemically to the crater rock because it's just the crater rock melted, right? So it's almost indistinguishable. And you will find that glass around the crater and usually to a maximum of 400 kilometers from the crater, right? And that's because when anything explodes, no matter how fast that material leaves, so if it's about hypervelocity debris, what they call distal ejector, right? So when this material is thrown out of the crater, no matter how fast it's going, it falls by around 400 kilometers. The reason for that is because the air ahead of it is being compressed. So it's dealing with friction, gravity, and obviously the air that's compressing ahead of it. So if you imagine a bullet going through water, you know, it stopped pretty quick. This is a similar kind of scenario. No matter how fast it's going, it's meeting that opposition and it will be slowed and it will drop to not much further than 400 kilometers. Some people have, some scientists estimate maybe a thousand. Mm -hmm. So compared to uh, a huge, giant, small moon size spaceship that is orbiting the Earth and is hit by uh, some kind of high energy weapon that we can't begin to understand. How does what you find fit that completely ridiculous to a lot of people, but potential scenario? How does it fit? Well, there's, there's two things, uh, two things I'd have to say. There's you can look at this, the most conservative conclusion of my work, I would suggest, is that you're dealing with an interstellar object, an unknown type of interstellar object, okay? So some people may be only willing to go as far as that, but the indications are that this has to be a glassy object, right? A highly silica glassy object. In other words, it appears it was already made of glass, fine homogenous glass before it exploded. Because as you just described, if it's made of a bunch of other stuff, then we're going to find all that other stuff in the tectites, right? Well, so yeah. And if it's homogenous, if the tectites are homogenous and well fined, and they didn't have time for that to occur because they're not in a cold era, they're not in a, you know, in a, an industrial plant being heated for hours, right? So this infers that there was not time for the, the, the body to be melted into a fine homogenous glass. So we should be seeing frothy, foamy, poorly mixed materials, but we're not. So the inference is that the parent body, whatever it was, was already made of glass, like homogenous fine glass. Now that's a problem because what kind of object is flying around out there that's a big silica glass body? There's no comets or asteroids or anything like that known in our solar system. So you have to go to either an exotic interstellar object that's natural, but again, you have to explain how that's formed, right? Or the more compelling argument is somebody has made this. This is, this is fine homogenous materials. Somebody has fined it. Somebody has mixed it. Somebody has made it. And the problem as well with the interstellar object hypothesis, again, this is you know, there's a couple of guys back in the days at NASA who kind of asked the question, you know, could this parent body be at least an interplanetary object? At the time, the, 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 the two positions were it was lunar, like lunar volcanic glass that had been blown off of the moon. And again, because of this very reason that they, they, they understood this appeared to be already glass and to have come from space. So a lot of the NASA guys were arguing this had to be lunar material. That theory collapsed when we retrieved lunar materials and realized it did not mesh with lunar rock, right? But their argument was very sound. One of the guys actually sort of said, well, look, what about if it came from interplanetary space or somewhere further out? They said, well, that's a problem. No one can take that seriously because what's the chances, of, first of all, an object like that, but also that it ends up in a geocentric orbit. Like, so, so then you start getting to this really strange, well, yeah, what's the chances that we're going to capture? There's an anomalous object and it's going to come in at just the right speed and angle to be caught in a geocentric orbit. How do you know it was orbiting? So two questions. One, how do you know it was orbiting? More science there that you know. But the other thing that you alluded to, I want to make sure we highlight it. You say these NASA guys were debating it. Again, this speaks to what you were saying before. 200-year-old mystery. 
You tie reference NASA papers where these scientists are speculating about the very thing that you're studying. So this is not, this is like that part of it is mainstream. The mystery is mainstream. The data that you're using is mainstream, verifiable. So then I just want people to understand that. Uh, orbit, yeah. how do we know it's orbiting, Bruce? Right. We know it's orbiting because, and there's a couple of reasons. If you imagine, uh, so you imagine, uh, say, a comet, something comes in from space. So say, let's say we thought that this was some sort of glassy comet came in from space. Now, if it comes directly in and breaks up in our atmosphere, you end up with a very small strewn field underneath because it will just break up. And it will just rain down directly beneath where it's coming in or an impact. You know, as, as we touched on, there's a problem with the impact theory. But if we say that it broke up coming into the atmosphere, you would end up with, I think they estimated something like um, about 10 kilometer wide field or something like that, very small. But what we've got is a 10,000 kilometer wide field. So, so the only way that this works out is if we have a body that has been captured and is in orbit, and then it breaks apart, fragments, and at a high temperature, because it has to, you know, it has to basically sort of blown up, it's melted to liquid. We know it was melted to liquid because the the tectites begin before they enter atmosphere. These tectites, the separate pieces are spherical, right? And have frozen very quickly so fast that they, there's no crystallization has occurred. And that would occur if there was an extended cooling. So we know the only place where that's really going to happen is in a vacuum, right? So if you get this material is melted to superheated to glass at 2,700 Kelvin, roughly, and then it is it becomes glass droplets. They form spheres because they're in space. So that's what the NASA guys are looking at. They're saying, well, that has to be that. They can see that the tectite buttons, which are a particular type of these tectites, then show secondary melting with aerodynamic shaping. So he said, in other words, these have skipped along the edge of the atmosphere, at very uh, angles, almost horizontal to the plane of the planet. So very, very um, gentle angles, skipping along and then slowly entering, which allows time for heating of the front of the sphere. There's a lot of the sphere evaporate but the front edge begins to run backwards and you get these aerodynamic shapes they look like the front of bullets almost because you know aerodynamic shapes right so they could understand that these had to to be on these gentle angles the only way that you'd end up with that is if the parent body is in orbit and what you have really is a debris field that is continuing on in the orbital paths of the parent body but they're now entering decaying orbital paths because it's, it's fragmented, it's blown apart, and some of them are now gently skipping along the edge of the atmosphere and entering. So that if you come in at any other angles, for example, if you think of a normal meteorite, when it comes in, coming super fast from space, first of all, and what you get is absolutely extreme heating of the outer surface, it evaporates. And that's where you get these, and they just come down almost the same shape as they were, those chunks, you know, misshapen chunks. There's no aerodynamic shaping on meteorites. They come in so fast that all that happens is the outer layer evaporates. And that's why these button tectites are unique. You don't find them anywhere else. And that's an important point. In the 4.6 billion years of history, these are the only known examples, right? So if these were just from any old meteorites, you would see these all over the planet, right? At various sites. You don't. You find them once. And so the NASA guys ran their experiments at the NASA Ames um, Research Lab. They did wind tunnel research using artificial glass spheres to see how you could shape these. And they found that they had to come in around about, uh, about 10 to 14 uh, kilometers per second and at angles also at 90 degree angles, roughly, and that you would end up with this kind of shaping. So all that, all that research was done by the NASA guys, right? They worked out this had to be coming in from something in orbit when it broke up. It, none of the other maths works, you know? I don't have to do the maths, frankly. They've done all that. Uh, and they found that that is the only scenario where you end up with these tectite buttons. What do we know and do we know anything new about the timing? And again, this is like, you've already mentioned this point. It's very basic. But when I heard this interview you did where the guy was totally hung up on this, you're looking to falsify the narrative. That's what you're really doing. And people mistakenly look that you're looking to uh, cherry pick and retrofit into it. And you're doing the opposite. You are trying to debunk your own theory. And then what comes out in terms of the date of the tectites and what's come out more recently? Yeah, I mean, there's first it says, well, that in, in the original account, you know, Valerie Barrow actually, she suggests that she feels 
that the debris from this craft is Moldavite tektites. So it's still tektites. But, you know, if I was going to be cherry picking and just trying to establish this narrative, I would be trying to argue that Moldavites fit the story, right? And they're trying to make the science fit that somehow these are the right age, you know, and the right characteristic. But I didn't find that. I found that they did not fit because the dating on them is millions of years old. Uh, but with the, the Australasian tektites, the most recent dating is done by the Argon dating method. So, you know, geological dating methods, uh, it, they come to what is considered now the most accurate dating of 788,000 years ago that this glass formed, you know, this melt occurred to this glass. So it doesn't tell you how the, old the parent object is, but it tells you when that melting occurred that formed these individual tectites. So that's, as it stands, is the most accurate dating. Again, not done by me, you know, this is obviously done by people with labs that can do argon dating. So as you know, as ever, I rely on that. So that's where we're at with the dating. So that's quite solid, you know, unless, you know, they somehow are contested. But even if you look at the older datings, they're all somewhere in that range. You know, the, certainly in the last few years, the datings have been done around 780,000 odd years. Of course, when we were talking before, I was saying 780,000, but the most accurate dating now is 788,000. Excellent. So anything else on the tectites uh, before we move to the genetic stuff, which is super fascinating? Yeah, I mean, the first one I say is that, you know, in, in many ways, the tectite area of this can be quite easily just disconnected from the whole story. For people that don't like, you know, stories of people's anecdotal accounts of having told something had happened, you know, I, I feel the tectite part is a standalone topic. Because at this point, I don't really care as such whether or not people believe in whether or not an elder, um, you know, and another lady had an encounter with an object. They can sign themselves. But what I can say to them is, tectites are a existing scientific mystery that has survived as a mystery for two hundred odd years with the greatest minds thrown at it. NASA's facilities opened up and used to explore them. It's a genuine, persisting mystery, and that the evidence points to this being from an anomalous type of object exploding in orbit. Now, I don't really care whether people want to believe in talking probes or, you know, or elders having powers. You know, if that is a problem for someone, I would say, well, just look at this tech type part on, your, on its own and go from there. Because I'm so confident in the kind of the, the level of evidence to at least, and again, most conservative conclusion, at least support the the argument that it is an interstellar object with an anomalous composition breaking up in orbit that, you know, I'm quite happy for someone if they stop there and just say, well, that in itself is massive. Even if they go no further than that, because that's an entire new class of objects and the earliest known example of an interstellar, you know, object arriving here and it's doing strange things. So that's why I'd suggest to anyone who's, who doesn't want to go there with any of the other elements, just ponder that for a moment and by all means check check everything I'm saying, look at the papers, you know, if you have a question, ask me. <laughs> How about that? You know, the most, some of the most important research we could possibly do. And you can ask them a question. Yeah, that's just fantastic. Let's talk about human accelerated regions. Sure. So, I mean, I, I personally think that, you know, the genomic SETI aspect of the story is absolutely fascinating and amazing. It's something we should definitely be going into. And a few years ago, and just before I I'll preface a little bit, a few years, a couple of years ago now, I'm not sure exactly when, I managed to get a question put to Sef Shostak. And I think most people, if you're into these topics, have probably heard of Sef Shostak. You know, he's SETI, um, he's just SETI Foundation's most um, senior astronomer. And so, you know, he's often the voice of SETI, you know. So I managed to get a question put to him by Mick West, the famous kind of UFO debunker, on his radio show. And I thought that was kind of amazing to have these two guys being part of my story at all. Um, and so Mick asked him what he thought of basically um, genomic SETI, which is investigating genomics to see if there is any evidence of genetic manipulation in you know, any organism on this planet. And he kind of just confirms what I already knew. He says, yes, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Paul Davies, like an esteemed kind of uh, astrophysicist, mathematician, has said for years, yes, we could do this. And maybe there's, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, saying that, yes, this is worthwhile doing and that it's, it's easy, it's cheap. It could probably be done by a graduate student in a couple of weeks. And then the bit that everyone should be thinking, well, why haven't you done it? 
I mean, these people have had millions of dollars, right, spent on radio astronomy, and they've got nowhere with it. it nothing, nothing has come out of that in terms of finding evidence of aliens. And he's sitting there, and he has the full faith to say they could have got some grad student to do this project over a couple of weeks with almost, let's be honest, no costs. Because how many people, how many grads, Alex, that if, if you think if esteemed voices like Paul Davies and Seth Shostak reached out to the community of science and said, we just need a couple of grad students to go over the literature and see if there's any anomalies in genetics that might indicate possible tampering in the past. They would have had thousands of people offering to do that. This relates back to the point we were talking about earlier, and it probably seemed incredibly tangential to people, but you've just made it relevant which is that once you probe deeper like you have, then everything looks different. And in particular, what all that looks like is as a social engineering, mind control, misinformation, disinformation, distraction campaign. It's not real for all the reasons that you just said. It's because it's very doable science. Mm -hmm. It could be done so the fact that it isn't done can only mean one thing, that it's a there's a purpose behind it not being done, right? Yeah, it makes you look that way at it because it's so, you know, to anyone listening to that, it's so glaring for someone like that to say that. And then it took not being done saying, yeah, it's reasonable. Yes, we've talked about it, but nobody's done it. I mean, that should make everyone question what the hell is going on in this search for extraterrestrial intelligence then, you know, if there's simple <laughs> projects being ignored. Let me make sure we frame this up correctly. We're talking about kind of this third element, this third uh, leg of evidence that could support the Chiringa kind of thing. So one of the things is that there's this big bombardment. We really didn't talk about number two. You mentioned it in passing that you couldn't have known about the the bombardment of the asteroids and the war, which we'll talk about maybe last, because I think that's super important too, in terms of culture, in terms of good ET, bad ET, save the planet. And now what does this story tell us? No, nah, that's that that quickly goes away when we have petty differences between thiefdoms, which doesn't that again resonate with talk about rhyming with history? How many times have we seen that? It's like, you might destroy the pet planet. I don't give a shit. I want him out of there. I want my I want me to dominate, right? Mm -hmm. And now that's ringing true 780,000 years ago. So I'm going to put that aside for a minute because we opened up the genetics thing. What is the information from the Chiringa that were the basic story, the narrative that we're going to try and find if there's any basis for in this in this very narrow time window now? Because we're at 788,000 years. It has to be in 788,000 years. What is the it that has to be in 788,000 years? Right, so what they describe is that there are some crew on this AI craft. That's what they're saying. Now, I can't just touch it because you won't find that. I don't think we're going to find bones or, you know, some astronauts out there. It's too long ago. But there is the claim that there are some survivors, that they come down in craft, smaller craft, and that although they cannot live here long term because they, again, some of this makes a lot of sense to me, is that they clarify that they use genetic engineering technologies on themselves so that they can inhabit other worlds. Now, again, NASA is actually exploring this today. So they talk about the games looping around, this idea that we may need to modify astronauts to send them to live on Mars and stuff because we're not suited to other planets, right, for a lot of reasons. So, so they're saying they do this. They use these advanced net engineering technologies on themselves so that they can live on worlds where the atmospheres and the gravity and stuff are different. Now, they haven't had time to do this before their ship is basically destroyed, as we'll come to. So they are partially changed but not enough to live here so they try they're dying from things like bacteria in the water the levels of solar radiation really like conventional problems that we would have going to an alien world so again there's logic to this not these stories where the aliens land and they can all breathe and they can all eat the food which again there's you know people should question those kind of stories. Well, why would that be the case but then they, they have a problem and so they come to this conclusion is that what they can do is with the remnants of their technology is that they can modify an existing hominin to make it more like them, upgrade it, change it, and set it on a path to become like them. And they feel that that is a, you know, a worthy plan B to their kind of colonizing this planet, if you like. So this is the, you know, not the plan, it's the plan B. 
And so they described taking some early, what we think of now as, you know, archaic hominins or super archaic hominins and taking them and in a lab, taking embryos, modifying and putting these fetuses back in to be born. So modifying fetuses and implanting and creating a new kind of human and describe that some of these, pro some of these experiments don't go well. They said a lot of their technology has been lost in this loss of the main ship. So they are working with what they have. So some of these initial experiments go wrong. Again, they're not perfect. They're not gods who can just do whatever. They have the same problems we might have with technologies, you know, that doesn't always work out. So again, I found that quite consistent and logical. A lot of that is quite logical and consistent with reality. Well, I, I knew that you'd have to look in a certain area of the genome in particular, and that's in what's called highly conserved non-coding DNA regions. And the reason for that is that if you're looking at genes, those change due to normal kind of selective pressures, right? So over time, genes change. Anything obvious from engineering would almost certainly be like lost. So you have to look for areas where the information stays very stable. You're building on existing science and existing scientific questions and challenges that the quote unquote mainstream is trying to solve because you didn't come up with these human accelerated regions, this 121 sequence. I mean, the, the scientists have done it for a reason that for their own reason, right? Yeah. I mean, my, my say is they sort of stumbled on this. So I don't think it was setting out necessarily to do that. They stumbled on these regions where they realized that, you know, in a comparative studies, that some of these segments of highly conserved code differ massively to expectations. You know, so when you contrast, and I, I, it's my favorite example, it's always this one with the HAR1, which is the first human accelerated region to be discovered, where they had cross-referenced chickens, chimpanzees, and humans. And what they found was that basically that in the chicken and the chimpanzee, this short segment, and I think it's, it's 118 DNA letters long, which is very short, especially in terms of if you're talking about genes, that would be very short. So that in these two species, there were two letters that were different. Now the chimp and the chimpanzee, sorry, the chicken and the chimpanzee have been evolving separately for at least 300 million years, right? So that's one successful stable change, you know, one letter changing for every 150 million years. So the reason this pops up is they go, whoa, this is interesting. Here's uh -huh. kind of an anomaly. This sequence here, it doesn't change at all. I mean, it changes two times in 300 million years. That's curious. What can we do with it? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we've, we've now got, you know, a, well, the whole genome has been mapped, for example, in humans. So I mean, we're at a point where the knowledge now is, you know, really vast and really intricate. So they're able to do these kinds of, you know, uh, detailed contrast between species. And so we, we understand, you know, the differences between us and a chimp and the difference between us and, uh, you know, an art, but we, we've got, we've got to this point where they can, you know, you can look for segments of code and contrast them going back to when, when were we last very alike to that creature? So, you know, we're able to trace it all back and say that, you know, see, this is the only difference is, is this, this, and this between us and, you know, uh, then an aardvark or whatever. So we can do that. So they're doing this. So they use this segment to then contrast and they can find that, okay, yes, in a, in a chicken and a chimpanzee, super stable, two changes. Oh, it's amazing. It must do something very important. Otherwise it would be lost. It would change more. So clearly small changes in it must have quite drastic outcomes. Like it dies, you know, because why wouldn't these changes keep happening and persist? Why is there only two successful ones in 300 million years? That code must be doing something quite important. So then if you look at chimps and humans, you expect it to be identical. That's because, you know, 300 million years for chicken and chimp, but only about seven or 8 million years difference between us and chimps. That's conventional understanding as it, as it is. So you would expect there to be none because there's not the 150 million years required for one letter to change. So what they found instead, though, was that 18 letters had changed. So that was just wildly outside the ballpark of what should have been observed. 
you're talking about statistics and mm -hmm. you can put that in the hand of some statist statistician and they can say, boom, and then they can compare that with seven, eight million years, 18 changes. They can crank that out in their Excel spreadsheet, not an Excel spreadsheet, but you get the point. And it comes out with a statistic that everyone would point to and say, yeah, that's that's the math. That's what it is. And the number is astronomically high that that would be by chance, right? Is that oversimplifying yeah. Yeah. it? No, absolutely. And in fact, the the discoverer of human accelerated region one um, names right on my mind, but she is herself. I think it's Professor Pollard, but I might have that wrong. But she is herself a biostatistician who helps design the programs that work out these kind of chances, right? So she does not, you know, she worked on programs to help understand the likelihood of that happening and so and that came out as essentially zero and that's what you know she ran it's in a, i think it's an american scientist or new science one of these magazines where she's saying basically it comes out as essentially zero so by any understood means of evolution that should not be the case so they're saying something we don't understand is acting upon these segments right so that's where they were at when they discovered it and obviously, there's been a series of papers now on HA on human accelerated regions. They found many more of them. There are at least several hundred. Now, some of them are understood a bit. Some of them have no understanding. They just know that they're there. So in other words, what they have found is that most of the ones where they have some understanding of what they do are tied up with uh, brain changes during fetal development. And I, and and I think that's massive. Okay, is there any way to tie any of this, and I know there is because I've read and listened to your stuff, to some of the dates we're talking about? Yeah, because we've got not only these changes, there's some other uh, interesting genes that occur, you know, that appear, well, there's one that's actually described, brain gene that's occurred as appearing fully formed from non-coding DNA, uh, which I think it gives us the, neuro, the neocortex. And then there's another one, there's a segment of a gene. So there's also, these, what is HARs? There are genes and segments of genes, and also the fusion of chromosome two. Right? All of these things are really important to, what, if you look into it, these are the things that are considered to make humans what they are, big brains, opposable thumbs, you know, all this stuff that makes us different to all the other primates. But so what we understand, because dating some of these changes is difficult at the genetic level to be precise, but what we do know is that from the fossil record, it was already understood that around about 800,000 years ago, there is an inexplicable sudden change in the cranial capacity of humans. And so for many years before the field of genetics, there was big questions over what was happening then. So in other words, we now know, of course, that those changes are expressions of genetic change. So we can see the physical shift underway that has to be tied to these genetic changes. So though you can't pinpoint date, we know, again, some of them are data between somewhere towards a million years or somewhere in the age of, you know, it's difficult to be that precise. But when you can see the physical changes, we can date those in the fossil record. So we know that this radical change in the human brain goes underway around about 800,000 years ago. Now, whilst we know is, of course, is that now we understand that Neanderthals, Denisovans, and the direct ancestors of modern humans, right? The 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 divergence, like, like the formation of these different groups, and the divergence from the archaic ancestors, that is happening roughly seven hundred to eight hundred thousand years ago, depending on who you look at it's paper. And what did we think that date was twenty years ago, or when you started this research? Because the dates shifted, right? Yeah, they shifted a lot. About four hundred thousand or so years ago. So this is totally different. So if you were to say 10 years ago, you know, oh, you know, I don't know, someone modified us and they created us in trials years ago. Well, no, because, you know, Neanderthals and us, we don't really separate until 400,000 years ago. Uh, and the beginnings of our species are probably 500,000 years ago. So, so this has shifted back just in the last few years. So we now understand, actually, no, there's evidence from proteins, from genes, from, you know, and from the fossil record, from teeth as well, they're looking at, where they've, they've now got enough evidence to say, well, based on everything that we now have, we can see that this, this split from these archaics towards these large brained humans, so it includes obviously Neanderthals, Denisovans, and us, that that is occurring roughly seven to 800,000 years ago. And the dating on the chromosome two fusion, which has another key change, 
that has been dated by at least one British biologist as being around about 750 or so thousand years ago, because you can see it happens at the beginning of this split between Neanderthals and Denisovans. They all have it as well, that that is happening at the beginning of that split. So we know that there's these things are occurring and we can see the changes happening physically here. So that's the interesting addition that, you know, rather than just saying it's somewhere like a million years according to genetics, we can say, well, let's look at the skulls. Let's see what's going on. And we can see this radical shift um, the cranial capacity just accelerates massively beyond body size changes, where in the past you could sort of track body size increase with skull capacity increase. So if you look around ancient thousand on the chart, and there are charts, people can look at this, there's a sudden acceleration in this cranial capacity. So again, you can mesh physical with genetics, which is really, I think, crucial. Okay, so I, I hope we've kind of made the case that you've approached this from a scientific perspective. And mm -hmm. while, as you said at the beginning, you know, you can't go to toe to toe with someone who has mm -hmm. multiple PhDs and fellowships on each one of these topics. But as anyone who's listening, this can tell, you can go toe to toe with them up to a point. And mm -hmm. if you were totally full of crap, you would be shot down and you're not being shot down. And as a matter of fact, your ideas are building upon the very best science we have of the time. Mm -hmm. So if we accept that as kind of the theory that we have to go to, what are some of the most striking implications for you, big picture wise? Who are we? Why are we here? What are UFOs? What, what do they want? How long have they been here? What are they doing? And what's good ET versus bad ET? Now we can ask those questions at a different level. What do you think? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because I mean, there's some things you can't answer. Like if we can establish, say that, you know, some intelligence was here with a technology 788,000 years ago, and that may well be, you know, intertwined with our evolution, either directly or just by the fact it's there, it's going to have some relevance to our evolution. Right. That I don't I can't say whether it came. I can't be certain on whether it came from outer space, uh, you know, from Alpha Centauri or the Pleiades, which I, know I suggest. But, you know, I, I can't confirm that. I can't confirm whether it wasn't some ancient Martian civilization or, you know, was dinosaurs. But what we can say is that some other intelligence alien to us was present. So then where are they now? So it opens that big question. Are they still lurking? And if so, what are they doing? Why aren't they making contact? What's their agenda? Or have they gone? In which case, I was thinking, will they come back? What would they do if they did come back? Or have they gone extinct? If so, why? Is that our destiny? I think it opens those questions and people have to start thinking, well, if they were there then, where are they now? What are they doing? What's coming for us? And those are definitely massive questions that instantly happen. And then, of course, if we've been modified, you have to then start saying, well, why? What is this longer term agenda? Have we been further modified? Will we be again modified, right? So the, these are massive, massive burning questions around this. Once you establish this, some reality to this. See, and I, I, I'm with you on all that. I take somewhat of a different take in terms of the burden of proof thing, because I think you've established UFO reality, spaceship. Mm -hmm. You know, so again, burden of proof for someone to say that silica object that's orbiting is not a spaceship. To me, yeah. again, it's, it's a spaceship. Spaceship. and by extension, if there's spaceships 780,000 years ago with advanced technology, then all bets are off. And when people want to start telling me about, you know, Roswell and all the rest, of that, I'm like, great, but we have to fit it now into this larger time frame. And we can talk about all the other stuff, but we can't talk about it's just advanced technology. It's like, really, it's just earth based advanced technology. Again, the burden of proof would be on you. But in doing that, you would have to incorporate in Bruce's object from 780,000 years ago. Uh, the aliens are good. And they're environmentalists, and they're trying to protect the planet. Well, again, now you're going to have to fit that in with a bombardment five years after this occurs, where they risk blowing up the planet in order to get the guys they don't like out of their underground villages. You know, mm -hmm. that doesn't sound like 
everyone in the Galactic Federation is on the same page in terms of how we deal with conflict. So do you get what I'm saying? What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. There's, you know, it, it, it make, should make us rethink the whole, you know, UFO, alien contact topic entirely. I mean, I, I, it instantly makes me think of, for example, you know, Jacques Vallée, you know, people are probably familiar with Jacques Vallée, but his idea that what we're seeing in the UFO phenomena and the interrelated aspects that connect to it. So everything from alien abductions to strange encounters and, you know, seemingly mystical experiences, uh, what he has referred to as kind of an evolutionary control grid. Now, if there is an intelligence interested in our evolution, and then you take the, the famous R.C. Clark quote of, you know, who's R.C. Clark said, you know, any uh, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. A lot of these things happening to people are magical seeming, right? Like, say, the abduction phenomena, it's magical seeming because there's a lot of cases where you can say they definitely were not taken anywhere physically because people were there and stuff, right? But they've had experiences as though they were on alien ships having, you know, eggs taken and things but don't seem to be happening in consensus reality in physical terms but are happening for them they've got ptsd and everything these things are happening to them in some way magical things now if we think of a technology or a race that is so incomprehensible to us that what it does is magical then you you have to reevaluate the whole thing and say yeah is this an evolutionary control grid which involves not only physical technologies maybe probes that watch and interact but magical stuff where, you know, things we can't comprehend that deal with interdimensional knowledge, you know, maybe some of it's technological, maybe some of it's their consciousness is able to hack into us in telepathic ways and project experiences into our brains. I mean, you, you have to start opening a door into what sounds like crazy sci-fi, but any species that nearly a million years ago could fly around in giant silica crafts, what is it doing now? Exactly. And there's a completely different way to take that as well. And that's the importance of, like we said, with the Turinga technology associated with it. And you always come back to that. I think the technology angle on this is super interesting. I think the silica ship, AI intelligent ship is interesting. I think the genetic engineering and the failed genetic engineering is interesting because it suggests, as does the silica ship, that maybe the technology gap isn't mm -hmm. what we might imagine. Maybe mm -hmm. it starts sounding a lot closer to mm -hmm. the kind of stuff we're familiar with. Oh yeah, we made the program, but the AI screwed up because it is just a program and we unplugged it and it, it, it didn't do what it's supposed to do. Genetically, gods. exactly. You know, oh, we genetically modified these fetuses, but we didn't really know how to do it because we didn't have the, you know, the right equipment. That's again, sounding very human. And this is now on the table. Because the other thing you said was Jacques Vallée. Love Jacques Vallée. Awesome, huge contributor uh, to this understanding of the phenomenon in, in general. But a lot of people take that and go the uber consciousness thing, right? So there's, there's, it's all consciousness, you know, there's none of this. Well, this flies in the face of that, right? The tectite that you hold in your hand is in this here now consensus reality. It is materialistic science that we've used to analyze that, to date that, to tell us what the elements are and how they're formed. That's very third dimension materialistic science too. So uh, again, that's why I think this work is so important because it kind of drives a stake in the ground. It says, hey, don't go too far with that. You want to go fairies and Bigfoot? Right. Mm -hmm. But it does kind of come back to spaceships and lasers from space too. You know, what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I tend to think of, to my knowledge, you know, and having looked at a lot of strange stuff for a very long time, that this is the only line of research where we can really do say stick that thing around and say, well, this is a physical event involving an alien intelligence, it's only alien to us, no matter where it came from, alien to humans that could do amazing technological things. Now, with the modern phenomena, the contact to ECF is it's really fuzzy, like which parts of that are psychical consciousness visionary or or our physical it's really hazy really hard to see that and I, I tend to take a step back and say i really don't know which parts of that are definitely physical so uh, where we had an argument for a lot about nuts and bolts versus woo woo consciousness nobody really knows where that line is in that modern phenomena but i can say well okay put that to one side 
let's at least establish that some of this is physical and that that's what this does especially as you said there is some physicality definitely to this and that would infer probably some physicality that continues to present somewhere amongst that strangeness that we can't tie down the john keel kind of you know conclusions that it's all you know just was it paraphysical the stuff that comes into reality seems physical can meld away that that seems to be going on too but we can infer that if they are physical enough to leave real debris that you can pick up that there is a physical element to at least some of these non-human intelligences that seem to be interacting with us maybe there's others that are just pure energy and you know you go into all that but we can't establish that yet so let's start with what we can establish yeah and, th and that of course that brings up the really level three kind of discussion about consciousness, extended consciousness, uh, good and evil in the extended consciousness, whether there is a moral imperative, and we could even talk about good and evil. The, the question I always boil it down to is, what does ET's NDE look like? Right? Mm. There's a near death experience, there's a reality to that consciousness from a physical standpoint should have stopped your brain has stopped your heart has stopped and yet we know that consciousness is continuing where is that consciousness going and then there seems to be this other dimension that it's going into what's happening for et and you know this is a a, a further inference than i think you would probably go or that a lot of people would go with your research but what i would think would be one of the, the the ways I would read it is that ET's NDE isn't maybe that much different from our NDE because mm -hmm. it starts looking like a lot of the same stuff and particularly the you know we didn't even talk about the bombardment thing but particularly that damn it I don't care blast them out of the sky hey they blasted us out of the sky let's come back and attack them I don't care if we blow up that blow up the planet that doesn't sound like transcendent consciousness to me that doesn't sound like god to me that sounds like you know it god i'm putting just in, in terms of how we would understand that unity consciousness that we're all somehow connected kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah i think it's certainly if it's a, no matter whether there may be intelligences that are pure you know love and light and all this, that there are also are others out there that are yeah more akin to us than we might expect you know, so it doesn't preclude that there aren't like angelic, perfect beings and, you know, living light forms. You know, all of that can also be true, but they are, you know, maybe surprisingly to us, but there are other beings that are recognizable to us in terms of we can imagine they probably went through a similar evolutionary path to us because some of their behaviors and their choices are recognizable to us. And I think that, again, gives us a sense of perhaps a better sense of not being alone than if we did find beings that were so radically different we're like well what do we even make of them you know whereas we can say well at least some of them there's some hope we might have a connection where we could understand each other because they seem to do things a bit like us and they're not perfect they're not you know infallible gods who you know never make a mistake or you know can never you know have a technology or wrong that they they actually are recognized in that way too and i think yeah that's really important because there probably are beings that we just we wouldn't know where to start with their consciousness, you know, and their thinking and would be like talking to a brick, you know, in terms of our chances of ever connecting with them. Right. Because it's so different. The consciousness types are so different that we would have no real hope. We could only recognize maybe that there's other life, but the other life is shut off from us because it's so strange. So I, I think this gives us a hopeful feeling as well, that we, maybe we can really connect with other intelligences out there because there's a little bit of us there in them as well, as well as a bit of them in us with the genetic. Bruce, finally, what do you think about the current state of this uh, conversation? It's at a totally different point than we've ever seen in our lifetime. It's, you know, what do you think about Lou Elizondo? You know, disclosure comes through an intelligence officer oh, from the Pentagon. Oh, what a surprise. <laughs> Anyone who wow. buys that story. What, what do you think about disclosure? We do seem to be going through it, no matter what you think about it. We're certainly going through, yes, yeah, some kind of narrative shift. Now, is it something being disclosed or is it a story being woven for us? In which case it wouldn't really be a disclosure because again, disclosure infers that this is that we're being shown factual hidden things, right? Now, I think it's gonna be very difficult for us to ever confirm that we are being shown factual hidden things versus being 
given a story that is preferred by certain people. Now, whether that's individuals or the intelligence community or the government, you know, how do we really know? Now, the only thing you can really establish that is if someone was to really say, I don't know, wheel out a craft and aliens, we could at least get to the point where we say, well, there's definitely a hidden, you know, there's an alien craft. They had one. That's a disclosure. But if what we get is just information, I think that's really problematic because we have no way to independently validate that this isn't just a story being woven for us. And there's um, a really interesting article by a guy called Alexander Wendt. And I don't know if you know him, but he, he writes about how really the control system can never reveal aliens to us because it's a direct threat to them because you're now putting a higher order above the top of the pyramid, you know, because instead of people looking to the apex as the political elite, everyone's going to ask, but what do the level of you know, these civilizational type three type beings think who really are in control of our solar system? Who cares what the president of America says? He's irrelevant now, right? Well, that, that's going to be a big problem for a system that is built on that control system. You know, it's yeah, I, 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 Dr. Alexander Wendt has been on the show at least once, but the counter to that is what we've lived through with the recent elections and with the Great Reset is that I think all that stuff is kind of irrelevant or being managed on a whole different level that we don't totally appreciate. And I also think the disclosure and particularly the New York Times disclosure. And again, I interviewed both Leslie Kane and Ralph mm -hmm. Blumenthal from the New York Times, who have the byline on that story. Number one, it seemed like to anyone who's paying attention, a political psyop from the beginning. Again, this Lou Elizondo character, you know, why is an intelligence officer the one leaking that would be the first question. But number two, it didn't do what it was supposed to do. So they're, they're constantly shaping the, the social narrative and the mind control experiment, but that doesn't mean that they're in control of it. My best read of it is they didn't know that it would go the way that it has in their attempt to disclose. So they're constantly tweaking it. And isn't that our history of what we've seen in terms of propaganda and misinformation? I mean, it's always a moving target. It's an evolving, well, let's see what that does. And then it's a chess game. It's like, okay, well, from that position, they did this, so now I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think particularly like, you know, say Stephen Greenstreet and the New York Post, who's done some really good investigative research into this showing that yeah a lot of the stuff that we said has changed it's an evolving narrative when you're being told an absolute revelation of truth it expands but it doesn't change right and what we're seeing is changing shifting sands in the narrative so that is should be a red flag to people and of course i'd say the majority of old hands in ufology have tended towards skepticism of this that they see a problem because they still remember the days where this is a lot of disinfo and a lot of military control going into the UFO world, whereas many of the people who've come in in 2017 onwards who've become diehard uh, UFO activists, as they to us, who are activists for disclosure, and it's all about the government and the military, and we need to let these people who know all the stuff, know what they're doing, take over the narrative, uh, you know, really are just so green, so green. It, it, it's it's unfortunate that they seem to have got the big traction on this and the other people who do know better have spent decades in this are being sidelined because of course the media and the, the intelligence community are loving these people loving them because yeah. they're also enabling this idea that the government is giving the people what they want so first you need to people to say we want this so you engineer a group of people who then call on the government to do it and it looks like you're responding to the people instead of just right. bringing out the story you're going to bring out in the first place that nobody would have believed without a call for it from ground level so it's it's amazing really to sort of see it working so you know exactly how you'd expect them to want it to work and that's what's happening so that should again be another big red flag and that well, certainly what a few hundred or a few thousand activists calling on senators makes changes how many people asked not to have jabs or not to have digital passports and we're totally railroaded millions of people but we're supposed to believe a few thousand ufo activists have managed to get congress to do all this stuff i'm sorry i'm not buying it richard doty strawberry ice cream i said i'd tell anyone to just google richard doty strawberry ice cream go from there
Bruce, it's been just fantastic. Uh, ben, I, I loved it. <laughs> I love talking about this stuff with you. You are the best, the best of the best. This latest book, Exogenesis Hybrid Humans, A Scientific History of Extraterrestrial Genetic Manipulation with your wife, Danny, the incomparable Danny. There's also The Forgotten Exodus, The Into Africa Theory of Human Evolution, Hybrid Humans, scientific evidence of our 800,000 year old alien legacy. And then you can go watch 780,000 our alien origin story. What's what's next? What are you working on? What do we should we expect to see from you? Yeah, I mean, I should within the next touch word within the next few days, get the final edit done on the tech type paper, and obviously arguing that this is an interstellar object, but also um, that it's most likely a techno signature, which would make it the first ever alien techno signature. And um, I can get that up onto pre print servers so they'll be accessible to everybody, you know, to the public, um, to any scientists or journalists that might be interested, most likely to be, you know, alternative media, I imagine, probably not mainstream media, but anyone that is interested in that, it'd be available. And I think it's important that people can check and see that. You know, I, I'm providing all the sources for this. And as I say, it's all from academics and NASA and all these people who, you know, have a more trusted authority in these areas, you know, for most people. Um, so that will be up, I hope, you know, very imminently. So I hope people watch that space. And with a bit of luck, at least the alternative or, you know, independent media um, may get excited about that. Let's hope so. Um, and we won't expect Fox and CNN props to jump right onto it. But you know, if some of these bigger, you know, independent platforms cover it, that'd be great. I'd be quite very, very happy with that. And if some scientists engage with it and start responding and saying, like I said, what's wrong with it? If you don't agree, explain it. Also explain why it's take 200 years to resolve this tech type topic, uh, unless you've got something radically wrong. That's a long time. 200. I, they've had the ball for 200 years before anyone's mentioned aliens. Great. Well, Bruce, as always, Fantastic stuff. Thanks so much for doing this. Take care. No worries. Pleasure. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks again to Bruce Fenton for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd have to tee up from this interview is, do you think Bruce has tightened up his game? That, of course, presupposes you knew his game before, which you should if you're listening to this show. But do you think he's moved us closer to really nailing down some of these theories he has. Let me know your thoughts. Love to hear from you as always. We are, whether we like it or not, in this together. So let's talk. Much more to come. Until next time, take care and bye for now.